Squeaks on Instagram. I'm making Shuttersome and Sweet huggable friends for you or someone you love. I'm also the owner and curator of the Edward Mobley Estate and Museum here in Old World in Huntington Beach, California. I collect Edward Mobley toys designed by Edward Mobley for Aero Rubber, Sun Rubber, J.L. Prescott, basically every company that he designed for around the world. I used to collect antique bird taxidermy. A lot of it is created using arsenic, and so while I was pregnant, I freaked out and was like, I shouldn't be around this as a pregnant lady, and definitely my baby shouldn't be around it. So I sold my taxidermy collection, and I still wanted weird things, but I didn't know what those weird things were. So one day we were at Long Beach Swap Me, and I found these really bizarre little elephants for a dollar. And I said, this is it. These are great, they're so bananas. They're coming home with me. So I took them home and washed them and found out they were two different colors and was like, this is amazing. They're so beautiful. I looked them up on eBay and was like, oh, there's some really good ones. And so I just started buying off eBay and Etsy. Then I had maybe 30. And I was like, this is it. This is what I collect now. Goodbye taxidermy, hello squeak toys. I thought everything he made, I would think I found the best one. You know, I'd be like, whoa, like this is not an elephant. This guy has a trunk that's four inches, but a body that's 10 inches and pig feet and dog ears. Like that is not an elephant, but it works. And I'd be like, this is the best one ever made. Like I found the best one and then you know, going through the like collector's um, obsession, I'd find a better one and be like, mm, like look at this lamb. She has a head the size of a hippopotamus and tiny little feet. Her ears are angry, like what? Like this is not a lamb, but it is. So the way I describe them, which might not be right, it looks like someone who was visually impaired touched an animal and then described that animal to someone who had never seen it and that person made a sculpt of what they described. It's the proportions, like you can have a realistic lamb and it's cute but you make the eyes a little bit bigger, the eyes a little farther apart, the mouth a little higher and suddenly it's the cutest lamb you've ever seen in your life. And I guess I like just like the the little differences that make them so wrong that they're right. I've read a little bit about it mimics a baby face and our brains are wired to think babies are cute because they have big eyes and like their proportions aren't that of an adult. So these have the same appeal in our brains. Like you see them and you're like, mm, cute. <laughs> these cats up here on the third shelf, her name is Mittens. This bunny's name is Pinky or Bobo, depending on what country it's from. This poodle behind me is Bonbon. Bon. The one below it, this is Raja, the elephant elegant, which always kind of trips me up because you want to say elegant elephant and it's elephant elegant, whatever. And then we have Jolly Jumbo. This is the first one that I ever got for one dollar. And then the bottom one is Taco the Burrow and Buddy Burrow. And they're two different donkeys. So what I do is I'll take Edward Mobley toys, originals, and reproduce them out of resin and then paint them. Or I'll take my own sculptures that I feel are cohesive with his work and have those cast out of resin and then paint them and sell them online or at designer con. My ultimate goal would be to create more characters for the line. I like to make work that I think he would be proud of. I made this cat head behind me, this little pink lady. I use a two-part epoxy. I'm not gonna drop the name because they don't pay me to do that. But yeah, it's just a two-part epoxy air dry clay. It takes me forever to sculpt anything. I'm very slow. I am not a get it done kind of lady. I liked clay as long as I can remember. So my dad is an artist and when I was little, we would buy Fimo. So I would just sit there and make like mermaids and dragons and unicorns, a lot of fantasy stuff. 
I was always into like fairy tales, so I would make miniatures. <laughs> Everything I do is to make my favorite artist, Edward Mobley, more relevant today and to bring awareness of his work while still creating myself because I don't know what would happen if I didn't maybe, I don't know, die. I guess that's the only, if I didn't create, I don't know what I would do with myself. It's really unfortunate that we never got the opportunity to hang out because I would have loved to like talk about his process and like where he gets these ideas from and where I get ideas from and like see where the two merge, but that's impossible. So now I just go off like an instinct, like would he like this? Would I have been able to work for this man, basically? Like my dream would be to work for him, but that's impossible, so. So Edward Mobley got his start in Ohio. He got a scholarship to the Ohio Institute of Art. After he graduated, he got a job for a company called Sun Rubber, who at the time was making um, gas masks for World War II shaped like Mickey Mouse. Like, you want oddities? That is it. They're beautiful, but they are really bizarre. And when children saw them, they absolutely hated them. Like, they were terrified. He moved on to working in, like, development. He was, like, their go-to for taking two-dimensional sketches and turning them into the toys. He did all the design for them. He did all the sculpting and all of the like paint on the prototypes. The toy world back then was pretty brutal. I think it still is. I'm such like a, a new little baby to this whole business side of it. He was a freelance designer, so he was working for multiple companies. He had a company in Brazil that he worked with, Australia, Canada, England, France. Like, so basically, anywhere that was producing squeak toys, he had his hands in that somehow. And there was a specific company that said, you work with us exclusively, or you don't work for us at all. And so he went down to the factory, which like happened to be relatively close to his home, and he pulled everything that had his name on it. So all the molds, prototypes, wax molds, original wax castings from the molds, boxes of toys still in their boxes. If it had his name on it, he pulled it from the factory. He boxed it up, put it in his studio, and it stayed there until he died. And then his children took everything from the studio and put it in a barn, like a well-kept barn. It wasn't like shoved in the back with like bales of hay. It was, it was really, really nice. And then it stayed there for 20 something years until I showed up. So <laughs> he never wanted them to be called squeak toys. They're soft, vinyl, safe, and sanitary toys for toddlers. His goal was to make something similar to a stuffed animal that moms were able to sanitize. It was just really inventive for the time. They were made out of a natural vinyl. They were painted with food grade paint. Things that in the 60s weren't considered important. I mean, they were still painting toys with lead paint back then and being like, here baby, chew on this. Like, ugh. Like, no, don't let your baby lick lead paint. Their original idea was to have these like beautiful soft ears and when you touch them, they're like minky on one side and satin on the other. So they have that like, I think we all have that like uh, whoopee, like your baby blanket that you like nubbed to death on the corner or whatever. Or maybe you only have like a little square of it left. So for babies, it was a really good tactile experience. Like they were based on everything. So like they're soft when you squish them and they squeak and they have soft ears that you can nubby to death and they have blinky eyes so that toddlers could connect with them. They really are a pretty amazing toy for the time. Just in the sense of like, they touch all the learning basics. So like kinetic learners, visual learners, auditory learners, like they touch every big milestone when it comes to early childhood development. And I think that's so special about them. His concept was like, they don't hold bugs, they don't hold scents, they're a more sanitary version of a stuffy. I am a 
completest through and through, which is why I can only collect one thing. If I collected more than just squeaks, and his squeaks in particular, I, I don't think anyone in my family would be happy about it because I need every color variant, I need every style, I just like a complete collection. And so when, when I've met other collectors that are also completists, like it is something we bond over is the need to have like a beautiful, pristine, complete collection so that you never have to go on eBay again. I had open heart surgery in 2011 while I was in the hospital and while I was resting at home. I also had a newborn at the time and there was a lot of sitting and being gentle with my body, but I am not a good sitter. I like to be busy. So I said to my child's dad that I was going to find Edward Mobley, <laughs> as any normal rational person does. So I got out my laptop and I just started Googling. And when I say Googling, I will go to the end of Google. I've gone embarrassingly far into Google, like page 206. I'm right there, that's me. Page two, schmoo. Like, I'm, I go deep. And so I found an address and a phone number that I thought, this was just a suspicion, might be related to Edward Mobley, <laughs> like any rational person does. I called the phone number, because that's not weird. Like, you're just living your life, and all of a sudden this woman calls you and says, Hi, I like squeak toys. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, what if it was the wrong number? I don't know what I was thinking. And so, um, I called the phone number, nothing. So I called again, like a month later, and left another message, as you do. When someone ignores your first phone call, you just call again. And so I did that for about eight months, and they still didn't answer, so, Again, as any rational person does, I took a photo of my collection, hand wrote a letter about how much I loved Edward Mobley's work, and I put it in an envelope, and I sent it registered mail, so they had to sign for it. So I knew they got it. At the time, I didn't know that this address had any link to him. I just had a suspicion. Surprisingly, they did not write me back, because again, that seems insane, and if someone did that to me, I think I would also be a little put off. So they didn't write me back, and I was, Oh, so sad. So then I was on the phone with my girlfriend. Uh, her name's Ashley. It's Ash Automaton on Instagram. And we've been friends since my daughter was born. And she also is a big collector. And we went through this whole experience together. And so I called her and I said, I give up. I'm done. It had been like two years at this point of me harassing this family. Do not do this. If you like something, I don't recommend this is the way to go because it could have ended so differently. So I called Ashley and I said, I'm done. I'm done harassing this family. Like they clearly don't want to talk to me. After two years, I've taken the hint. And she said, no, hang up with me and just call one more time. So I call and I hear, hello? And I'm like, I've got you, you're mine. Like, yes. He's mine, Mwahaha. I asked for Edward Mobley and he wasn't there, but his family was. And so we just talked about him for three hours. And, um, you know, I mentioned that I wanted to make a book about him and how important I thought he was and how talented. I'm his number one fan. There might not be a lot of us, but I am number one out of the 12 people that collected his work then. <laughs> So we have this long conversation, I take a million notes because I'm, I'm big on like uh, note taking and, and keeping everything organized, like it's something that's really important to me. And at the very tail end of our conversation, like I don't even know what compelled me to do this, but at the tail end I just said, hey by any chance do you have any of your dad's work left over? In my head, I imagined maybe catalogs saved, maybe original sketches. I did not expect the response I got, which was, we have an entire warehouse full. And so I said, oh, that's amazing, and I would love to buy it if it's for sale. He said, why don't you fly out to look at it? So during this 
first phone call with this man, it ended with me booking a flight to Ohio while we were on the phone together. I was like, deal, where and when, I'm there, boop, I'm coming. So I flew out in August and before I flew out there, he would not send me any pictures of what he had. When I would ask how much stuff there is, they would just say a lot. A lot can mean many things. I think it means something different to every person. You can say that this is a lot, but I know numbers wise, it's not as many as say a completist of Star Wars. Like that, to me, that would be a lot. Mine is also a lot, but someone might have seven and say they have a lot. So we get out there, we get to the, the house, and he had taken a, like a few things and brought them to the house. So when I got there, I was like, wow, this is amazing. It was very hard not to have sticky fingers and be like, mine, 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 mine. But they didn't belong to me at the time, so I, I was trying really hard to respect that, and it was awful. Like I wanted to just grab every single one and shove them in my purse and run back to California as fast as I could. So the next day, we went to where they were stored. They opened the doors and it was a lot. <laughs> boxes upon boxes stacked in this barn and then all the copper mold. And I was just in heaven. You know, imagine collecting something and finding out it's great and then going somewhere and it's all there. Every single thing. And they're all still in their boxes. We pull everything out of the barn and again I'm like, <sighs> you can't buy this right now. You need to control yourself. So I mentioned wanting to purchase everything, like all at once, and he said, you can purchase them on your next trip out here. And I was, next trip? Oh, um, okay. On the first trip, I did take a few things that I was like, I'll die if this doesn't come home with me. So <laughs> I went home with four boxes originally, and I was like, got home and, and ripped them out. Oh, so beautiful. And then on my next trip back was when we took everything from the barn, everything. So copper molds, boxes upon boxes of original sculptures, um, color variants, boxes from the factory with toys still in their boxes, and shipped it all back to California. At the very end of our day when I bought everything, like we're signing contracts and we're, okay, it's yours now. I had him add a caveat that said, and the rights. And that was it. And it was like, that one little incident made it possible for me to own a company. It probably took like six hours to load the pod with help from my girlfriend, Holly, and her husband, Rick. Rick did all the work and Holly and I just sat there and like ooed and awed over cute squeaks. The pod got to my house and it was really overwhelming, but like Christmas day overwhelming where you're like, everything is amazing and this is so great. And everything that I pulled out, I felt like, oh my God, I've never seen this thing before. And put it over here. Oh, I've never seen this thing before and put it over there. From the condensed boxes that we made, there were 273 boxes and all the molds. I couldn't keep everything, so my whole goal was to separate what I was keeping and separate what I was going to sell because I wanted to create a community for Edward Mobley. I wanted more people to care about his work. And the only way to do that is by sharing it. If I would have kept all of it, it would have remained me and 12 other people that collected Edward Mobley's work. So after I separated everything, I had my friend's little sister come and be my first assistant ever, who I'm still obsessed with. And I love her so much. And I mean days of going through boxes. The wax molds that he created were wrapped in tissue from the 60s. But if you've ever had a tissue explode, that was all over my house. <laughs> it was a big mess. You don't want to be in this. I have a pretty big living room. Spread it all out in the living room and just like bask in the glory of all this hard work. What I bought it for was my life savings. And I have a family. It was not a financially responsible decision to make, but I made it. So I need to make this money back to support me, 
my daughter and all of our living expenses. So we just started making Etsy listings. And I would say in the first six months, I already found that people were connecting with them and really cared about them and were really invested in this like banana story about this weird woman who found the creator of her favorite toys and like lived out every collector's dream. Like I'm so proud of myself. I don't care how that sounds. It was a lot of work. I deserve credit for it. But also so lucky that those things did stay so safe and that his family kept his work so safe for so many years until I came and found them. Like they were waiting for me. But I had no idea what I was doing to be young and stupid because there wasn't a community yet that was big enough to sustain what I had bought. Like there weren't enough people to buy everything I had bought that I knew. But now I know that there were pockets here and there and that it was just about finding them. What I'm trying to do is like put us all together in this like weird, kitschy world. Like we're all gonna be nice to each other. We're all gonna be gentle. We're not going to be mean collectors. That's sort of working out, but it takes a lot of work to make sure that people are kind to each other while still falling in love with his work. Because as collectors, we want everything and there's a lot of competition there and so my goal is to like curb that for people and tell them there will be another one I promise you no company in the history of anything has been like well we spent hundreds of thousand dollars developing this product and we'll make one that is not how it works So when it comes to grails, like, I guess the company that <laughs> is my grail. But so many of them are precious to me because I have a lot that he hand painted himself. There's a few up here that he was working out ideas with. So like, I have a few prototypes that were never created. So like, there is just one. And I would say those are pretty special. In our agreement, I agreed not to use his name on product. Um, for family reasons. I'm still really protective over his family. They're very important to me still. Like I still reach out and make sure that like they're doing well and I have 4,000 ideas that go through my brain every minute of every day. I'm like I should do this, I should do this, I should do this, I should do this. So currently I'm working on a book, I'm working on resin reproduction, I'm working on a top secret thing that like with an NDA. I'm working on miniatures of his work. Oh, I have so many things that I'm, the future is, there's a lot. <laughs> but I'm just, I'm just trying to do what, what feels right by him. Really what I'm focused on currently is like working on a book about all of his work, like what he brought to the toy community, how truly special Edward Mobley's work is still. You know, even though he's passed away, in my opinion, he was one of the most talented artists. I don't want him to be forgotten. You know, I don't want him to just be some, oh, I, I kind of remember those toys and like, whatever. Like, I truly can't let that happen. It would break my heart. Okay, we are inside my museum slash very small retail slash Etsy store. So I've put all of his work behind me and then on the other side is the toys and their packaging and so you're free to make an appointment on Instagram and come by and check it all out. The reason I got this space was years ago I had it set up very similar but it was in my garage and when you have a partner who likes motorcycles and cars and the garage <laughs> needed to become his space and uh, the way we function as a family is he goes there, I come here when, when we need like healthy alone time. Everyone who knows me is gonna laugh real hard right now, but if you send me a DM, I will send you my phone number. I'm like not real private. So you can DM me on Instagram at bittersqueaks. You can make an appointment there if you're more comfortable with that and I will meet you here 
at Old World in Huntington Beach. Come by with your stuff and I'm happy to tell you whatever I know about it. Even though I, I only collect Edward Mobley, I'm pretty well aware of squeaks that weren't designed by him. So like if you want to bring your stuff by and say like, what is this? How do I find more of this thing? Like, I'm happy to help you and like guide you in your collecting. I'm a firm believer in there is enough crap for all of us. <laughs> like, there is enough stuff out there for everyone to be happy.